Great, thank you, Andy. And thank you to Iris for hosting this webinar. And also thanks to Martin Unsworth for giving us all a really great review of MT about a month ago. So today I'll be talking about some of my research on exploring Antarctic subglacial hydrologic systems using magnetotellurics. And I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators, my advisor, Carrie Key, Matt Siegfried, and Helen Fricker. To start, we'll look at just a simple cross section of Antarctica. So here I have ice sitting on top of a till layer, which is sitting on top of a sedimentary basin, which we will say is impermeable for now. So this wet deformable till layer can act to reduce friction at the base of the ice, allowing it to slide faster. Additionally, basal water in the form of lakes and channels is another hydrologic feature that can modulate ice flow. And traditionally, it's been thought that the water in this system is generated from melt at the base of the ice, uh, but it's also been suggested that this sedimentary basin is actually permeable and filled with groundwater. And this groundwater can interact with the till layer and further contribute to the flow of ice. So the question that has been posed is, is groundwater abundant in Antarctica and does it control ice flow? And for today's research vignette, I'll just focus on answering the first part of this question and how we're answering that question uh, with magnetotelluric data. Uh, so regions in Antarctica that have fast ice flow that's, that's uh, modulated by hydrology at the base of the ice sheet are called ice streams. Uh, so here, this map of Antarctica is showing ice flow. So warmer colors represent higher ice flow velocities. And our ice streams are just these fast flowing features extending uh, into the interior of Antarctica. And the results I'll show you today are from the Willens ice stream. And the Willens ice stream we know has a deformable till layer, a subglacial hydrologic system at the base of the ice, uh, but we also want to know if there's groundwater in these systems. Uh, so in order to do that, we collected a magnetotelluric survey and we collected 44 stations uh, over six weeks in the field. And today I'll just focus on our results uh, over this subglacial lake called Willen Subglacial Lake. So setting up an MT site in Antarctica um, is pretty similar to land surveys. You, oh, let's, okay, first you unpack uh, your gear. Once you arrive at your site, then you orient your site using your compass, and then you bury your magnetometers and electrodes. And here you can use magnetometers, uh, the same ones that you would in land surveys, but the electrodes that you use uh, need to be specialized and you also need to pair them with pre-amplifiers. And finally, once everything is in place, you plug everything in. And here we just use a tri-wall cardboard box uh, to protect our data logger. And this worked pretty well for us. Uh, so we were able to collect 27 stations over Lake Willen, spaced two to three kilometers apart. And here I've highlighted a line of stations and I'm showing one polarization of their response functions over here uh, in the same colors, where we have resistivity on the y-axis and period on the x-axis. And just looking at these partial response functions, uh, we can see that we are sensing some variability using MT. And when we do a 2D inversion of this data, uh, we can see we're looking here at the upper five kilometers beneath the ice surface, uh, spanning about 15 kilometers laterally. And the two main features that I see here are this uh, conductive zone, which is about 0.5 to 1 ohm meter. And this zone is underlying underlain by a deeper resistive feature, which is about 50 to 260 ohm meters. And my initial interpretation of this is that we have salty groundwater 
And we think this groundwater is at least the salinity of seawater. And this is underlain by some lower porosity rock. And our groundwater is about 0.9 kilometers beneath the base of the ice uh, near the upstream portion of our lake and then about half a kilometer beneath the ice towards the downstream portion of the lake. And when we do a 2D, uh, multiple 2D inversions and stitch them together, we can see that this salty groundwater layer seems to be pretty pervasive throughout uh, the spatial footprint of our subglacial lake, except for maybe over here uh, on our off lake sites. Uh, so to me, this, I'll just go back real quick. This result indicates that there's probably a uh, salty groundwater throughout the Willens ice stream and perhaps in other Antarctic ice streams as well. So just going back to Antarctica, uh, we have two places that I know of where electromagnetic uh, data has been used to observe groundwater and that's our survey in the Willens ice stream and also in the dry valleys of Antarctica. Uh, airborne EM was used to find salty groundwater as well. And I'd also just like to highlight some other MT surveys that have been completed uh, in Antarctica. And I'll just point out two of these surveys saw high conductivities in the near surface and suggest that there could also be groundwater uh, there as well. And there's a great review paper about electromagnetic studies in polar regions by Graham Hill. So if you're interested in learning more about MT and other EM methods in Antarctica, I highly recommend you check that out. So I'll just end it here by saying there's still a lot of Antarctic real estate to cover with regards to MT and probably a lot of groundwater yet to be discovered. Thanks. Thanks so much, Chloe. Well, that was right on, right on time and on schedule. So we will uh, move on to our next speaker who is uh, Jared Peacock. And I'd encourage everybody, if you are out there and you have a question for Chloe, please uh, take a moment to type it into the question box and we'll keep rolling and hit those at the end. We good? All set. Cool. All right. Uh, yep. So I'm Jerry Peacock. I work for the US Geological Survey as a research geophysicist. I've been MT for about 10 years. So I suppose that puts me about green belt level. Uh, and I'll be talking about how we characterize geothermal systems with MT. Uh, so why do we use MT for geothermal? Well, MT is great at, uh, very sensitive to where fluids are and where they have been. Uh, and so MT is probably the best tool to image geothermal systems. Um, if you notice, the targets that we're looking for, the fluids and the alteration, they're all in the conductive region and they're all similar conductivity. So when you do an MT survey over geothermal, you need to use other geophysical information to understand what each of those conductivity anomalies represent. And so I'll just go over three systems with you real quick uh, over the seven minutes. Uh, so first is Long Valley Caldera in the Long Valley Volcanic System. Uh, one of the most active, well, probably the next eruption will occur a little bit north of the caldera near Mono Lake. Uh, where there was a push-up of Ahoa Island, which is in the center of the lake. So we did an MT survey out there before, and we had this large gap uh, where the lake was. And I was talking to Steve Constable about this uh, marine guru, and he said, uh, we could probably change some instruments so that we could collect data in the lake. Uh, and so we did, and so we filled in a nice data gap there. And he's got a master's student working on that data, and on the right is an image of her 2D profile. Uh, and you can see down below about five kilometers, there's this nice conductor, likely the hydrothermal reservoir. And it's got a connection up to the surface where there's active hot springs. Uh, so that's a pretty cool result. Um, and we should see more in the future. And if we move further south, Long Valley Caldera, there's a lot happening in the caldera. There's fumaroles, there's uplift, 
there's also a geothermal system. And, and the thought is that within the caldera, the upwelling zone is on the west side and it flows eastward out across the caldera. And here in the middle, there is a geothermal power plant called Casa Diablo that's operating and, and generating power from these geothermal waters. One of the questions was, how is this related to the volcanic systems? We went out and collected an MT survey and came up with a 3D resistivity model using mod -EM, And we can pick out a bunch of different anomalies, but I want to point you to the C3 here, which is imaging the hydrothermal system. So you've got downgoing fluids, they heat up about five to six kilometers, 250 degrees C, and then they upwell, hit an impermeable layer and flow eastward across Okay. And you can put some arrows on that, and Jeff will talk about validating those arrows next. Uh, just some eye candy, I'll show what this looks like in 3D. So you can look at the conductive anomaly. So here you're seeing the hydrothermal system. You got the downwelling fluids heating up, coming up. And then you got other things happening, something under Mammoth Mountain. Other cool things. Uh, next example is from the geysers. So the geysers is the world's largest geothermal uh, power producing field in, in the world. Said uh, the heat source there is a thermally conductive pluton that's been episodically reheated from injections below. Um, the system has been running for about 40 years, so they know a lot down to three kilometers, and below that they don't, they just interpolate. So we went in and did an MT survey to see what we could see. And you could pick out three basic features. So in the deep, about seven kilometers and deeper, you have this conductive zone, which is likely a zone of partial melt. Um, you have this thermally conductive source rock. Um, and so this blue is, if you just take their information and interpolate down to three kilometers and past, uh, this lighter blue is if you just look at the MT and you notice, notice this nice little thumb that comes up, that pops up right underneath the hottest part of the geysers, which is likely a representative recent intrusion. And then you can also uh, image the steam field. And what's cool is if you just take the steam field and use an Archie's law, you can estimate steam saturation uh, within the field. And this will help operators look to where they need to inject and where they need to extract. And if you do maybe a time-lapse survey, you can show changes in the field. And the next example is from Gabs Valley uh, in the Great Basin. And so the Great Basin is full of geothermal systems. And these are deep circulating fluids that pop up near dilating faults. And most of the time, there's no surface manifestation of hydrothermal activity. So these are called blind systems. And so I'll just give you one example from Gabs Valley, uh, where you can see there's a nice conductive cap, and then this deeper resistor, which is a structural control on where the fluids go. And if you use other geophysics and geophysical information, gravity, magnetics, and MT, you can make an educated uh, cartoon about what the fluid flow might look like. And something and so just in summary, so MT is probably the best method for imaging geothermal systems. Why? Because it's sensitive to where fluids are and where they have been. So that's plate caps, permeable faults, zones of alteration, heat sources, and where the fluids are. Uh, MT also is great because it has depth information and directional information, which makes it conducive for 3D modeling. And uh, if you want to understand your 3D model, then you need to use other geophysical information. And that's all I had to say. Thanks for listening, and back to you, Andy. Thanks, Jared. Uh, all right, well, we will keep moving and uh, switch over to Jeff. So, Jeff, here you're, you're going to get screen control. Uh, one second here. It's showing up on the wrong slide. So put that on the primary. 
Are we good now? Looks good. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so it's a pleasure to be a part of this. Um, so we're going to be talking about using MT to inform hydrothermal models. So just a brief overview of hydrothermal modeling for uh, the non-hydrologists in the crowd. Uh, this is where we're trying to computationally represent uh, groundwater flow systems in one, the three dimensions, by simulating groundwater heat uh, and or solute transport on the local to the national scale. Um, all of these models, they require the specification of subsurface properties, uh, such as permeability, porosity, thermal conductivities. Uh, the uncertainty with the specification of these properties, that affects your modeling results. And these models are often used to guide resource management. So anything that we can do to reduce our uncertainty with our modeling results is something that we're interested in. Uh, that's where MT comes in. As uh, Jared really hit on, the uh, uh, electrical resistivity is affected by fluids. And so that suggests that MT may be able to inform things in our models, such as solute reaction rates, subsurface properties, uh, groundwater flow paths, fluid salinity. Um, and each of these things, as well as others that you may be able to think of, uh, that would require a different level of geologic understanding uh, in a given study area. And so that's gonna be a limiting factor of how, of how effective this pairing could be um, on a case by case basis. However, in areas where you're not super confident about say, you know, solute reaction rates at depth, uh, you might be able to take a conceptual model like what Jared just showed where you have arrows kind of flowing through the subsurface, throw that into a hydrothermal model and play around with the geology and the permeability to see kind of like, is this plausible? What, what would need to happen for this to actually um, give you the temperatures and salinities that you see at the surface or in the subsurface? So this is just an example workflow of uh, calibrating model permeability with MT. Uh, so pretty straightforward. Uh, first step, obviously go out, collect your MT. Uh, second, construct a hydrothermal model of the system. And third, you take that hydrothermal model and you'd, you'd calculate resistivities from it by using the simulated temperature and salinities in order, and uh, something like Archie's law in order to bring up a theoretical resistivity. And then you'd compare the MT with your calculated resistivities and you'd refine the, the model permeabilities until you get a better match to the MT. So pretty straight, straightforward calibration procedure. And we've done some uh, sensitivity work that actually suggests that this could be successful. Uh, for this project, we modeled a simple synthetic regional flow system, just sort of a, a proof of concept uh, analysis to see what kind of uh, range we might be able to see by, by varying permeability. So we modeled this regional flow system and we varied just permeability. We converted the simulated temperatures and salinities to resistivities. And then we computed the forward MT responses at two kilometer station spacing along the model domain. We added noise to those responses and then analyzed the data as if it were real data by using 2D inverse modeling. And so what you're seeing in this figure on the right side of it, you're seeing the inversions. On the left, you have the forward model input of the resistivity fields that the model, that the uh, hydrothermal model yielded. And you see in the inversions, we are able to, to recover uh, distinctly different um, results for the high permeability and the low permeability scenarios. And these were sort of uh, low and high permeability end members. So this is kind of a contrast that you could expect to see in the best case scenario uh, from permeability alterations. Uh, these results were also pretty non-unique. Uh, specifically, we only varied permeability. So we assumed that we knew what solute reaction rates were in the subsurface. Uh, so in, in cases where you don't really know that information, you can do what we're calling uh, exploratory modeling. So this is just a simple exploratory case study in uh, Truth or Consequences in New Mexico, which is an amagmatic low temperature hot spring system. We had a hydrothermal model that was already put together. We put it back, we put it together back in 2015. Uh, that model suggested that in order to match the salinities and temperatures um, and groundwater flow rates that we see uh, near the surface in the hot springs district, uh, we would need to open up the crystalline basement permeability um, and allow fluids to penetrate deep into the basement, uh, which is pretty odd because most hydrologists, you consider the basement pretty much impermeable, you often ignore it. And so this was a pretty interesting result that we wanted to interrogate further. 
Um, and so this, this figure is just showing that flow path, uh, deep circulation in the basement, uh, recharge in the left, and then discharge to the right side of the figure in the hot springs district uh, within the permeable rocks of the Rio Grande Rift. So here are the hydrothermal modeling results, uh, salinity, temperature, and those two things converted to resistivity by using Archie's law. Uh, so you see that, that there's some interesting patterns here. The elevated salinity, you get that in the sediments uh, due to low flow, low flow rates. Um, but then you also get elevated salinity at the base of the model, uh, shifted preferentially towards the discharge area. The temperatures, you get the highest temperatures sh uh, shifted also towards the discharge area. Uh, and this yields a resistive recharge area. So the, I don't know if you can all see my cursor, but uh, resistive recharge area in the bottom part of, of panel C, and then a conductive discharge area, as well as conductive sediments. I'm comparing this to MT. We went out and we did an MT survey. And so that's now shown at the top of this, uh, top of this figure. And right below it is that same resistivity figure using Archie's law, but they're on the same color scale now. Uh, so you can see that the hypothesized upflow zone associated with the hydrothermal system, the resistivity is actually pretty decent. Uh, these yellow colors are, are really similar. Uh, however, the basement is far too resistive in our model. Uh, it's well over a thousand ohmmeters. And so that got us thinking, what are some potential reasons for that? Uh, one could be that the Archie exponent that we used is too high, which would suggest the fluid is more connected than we're modeling. Uh, the next one was that porosity is too low. Uh, that, that might imply that there's secondary porosity that we're not taking into account in our model. Uh, another possibility is that the solute reaction rates are too low, or perhaps the rock resistivity is non-negligible. Um, so on the bottom, here uh, panel D, I'm showing rock resistivity model as being 200 ohm meters, whereas in our original one, we, we, we modeled that as being uh, 10,000 ohm meters. So you see you get a much better, much better fit with the uh, rock resistivity as 200 ohm meters. So there may be some alteration that's driving down the rock resistivity, but we don't really have enough information to say which one of these is correct, or maybe they're all correct to some degree, but all of them, they do suggest that deep cir groundwater circulation is plausible. So this is kind of an example of how this exploratory modeling might tell you something about the uh, dynamics of your system. So just to wrap up, uh, the dependence of electrical resistivity on subsurface properties and fluids that encourages this pairing of MT with hydrothermal models. Uh, our ongoing research suggests that M MT may be valuable for reducing subsurface property uncertainty, but it is, it is non-unique and so that to overcome that non-uniqueness you do need to have adequate knowledge of the subsurface and this is going to be a limiting capability this is going to limit your capabilities on case-by-case -case basis uh, however even exploratory modeling can interrogate the plausibility of of conceptual models so that you can better understand your system so with that thank you thank you jeff all right well let's uh we'll keep it rolling over to paul so paul i'll be Sending you screen control. And... Um... All right. Bear with me one second here. Oh, looks good on my end. Okay. All right. Um, well, yeah, thank you, Andy. Um, so I'm going to transition a little bit away from uh, kind of the fluids and melt, which you find in kind of active young systems, um, and kind of look at uh, ancient systems. I can talk a little bit about MT for mineral resource investigations, um, not necessarily in the exploration sense, although MT is commonly used at a deposit scale for exploration, but uh, in support of mineral resource assessment, where the aim is really to kind of estimate at a regional and national scales, sort of the amount and distribution of undiscovered mineral resources. Um, let's see, trying to get a slide to advance. There we are, thank you. Um, so we're using a mineral systems approach, which was developed in Australia, in which 
we look at ore deposits not so much in an isolated sense, but as part of a suite of genetically related deposits that form in a particular geotectonic setting or episode. Um, the deposits themselves kind of represent a progressive concentration of metals through space and time, which is sort of shown schematically in this uh, figure. And understanding these systems involves ne needing to understand kind of the components of them uh, necessary to concentrate and preserve metals. So we're gonna just look at a couple of them here. In particular, we're gonna look at the source rocks. Um, and for us, that's gonna mean looking at ancient sedimentary rocks that are a critical um, source of sulfur for base metal sulfides, as well as transport pathways. And these transport pathways often are at crustal or lithospheric scales. And these are really critical as they appear to be a major component of uh, world-class mineral deposits. So uh, we're gonna look at two regions that are shown here in these boxes in the upper um, northern mid-continent and the southern mid-continent. And I wanna stress that these are multi-scale investigations in much the same way as uh, the mineral systems approach is sort of multi-scale. So the background in white is long period MT from uh, earth scope and lithoprobe investigations. What's in red is uh, more recent USGS wideband MT. And uh, on top of that, we're going also to even finer scales, looking at the upper few hundred meters with airborne electromagnetics and tying this ultimately to uh, laboratory resistivity measurements on uh, drill, hole, drill cores. So the first place we're gonna look is in the Northern Mid-Continent um, and highlighted here in colors are the rocks of the Mid-Continent Rift System. Um, geologically, this is an area that has gone from being a passive continental margin in the late Archean uh, was a collision zone in the Paleoproterozoic and transitioned to rifting in the Mesoproterozoic associated with the Mid-Continent Rift System. It's also suffered numerous thermal and deformational overprints as the Laurentian uh, continent grew. It's host to a range of mineral deposits. Um, I've just highlighted the magmatic uh, mineral deposits of the Mid-Continent Rift System. And this is a very significant area. The largest national resource for titanium sits over here. Uh, there is a, the only active nickel mine in the US uh, is sitting right here. The rift also hosts a variety of hydrothermal deposits, which I've shown here, including the, the world-class native copper deposits, which were historically mined. And this is basically the copper that electrified the nation. Um, and uh, there's additional deposits in the older pre-rift rocks, included banding, including banded iron formations in Northern Minnesota and in uh, upper Michigan. One thing I want to add is that uh, the area outlined in red is what you, where you have exposed Precambrian basement. Everything else is beneath cover. So our goal is to kind of expand our mapping much further into these covered regions. I'm going to jump right to a 3D resistivity model. Um, so you're looking at a relatively shallow depth slice at one kilometer. And again, we're looking for these sort of sedimentary host rocks, potential sulfur bearing rocks. So most of the area is resistive in blue, but these areas I'm highlighting here, these are areas where we have plastic rocks of the mid-continent rift system. And um, you know, several of these have geologic exposure, but for example, on the right here, this is the eastern rift arm, which is completely concealed. We also have older sedimentary rocks. These are paleoproterozoic now. And um, these rocks are of particular interest for base sulf, uh, um, metallic sulfide mineralization. And again, we're doing this at a sort of a range of scales. So if I zoom into that one box, now what you're looking at is a cross section from airborne electromagnetics. So the Y axis is basically that cross section is about 500 meters top to bottom. And you can see that that conductor is now broken into a whole suite of these sort of vertical stringers, conductive stringers, which when you drill into them, recover graphite. So we can start to get an understanding of the source of the conductivity. These are coming from, um, uh, these are metamorphic metasedimentary rocks that are associated with the uh, suture zone at the, uh, at the edge of the Archean. If we go a bit deeper, we can sort of see this, uh, um, see the outline of the suture zone. This black line here is basically the southernmost exposure of the suture. And so we're really highlighting that former continental margin along there. And there's good association with surface geology. 
as I flip back and forth here, you're looking at a particular paleoproterozoic gray wacky, but we can extend the picture again beyond cover. See area I'm highlighting here, both phanerozoic cover as well as younger rift rocks. And lastly, I'll just point out that uh, you have similar rocks over here in northern Minnesota. These scraps of high conductivity appear to have been sort of split or bifurcated by this big resistive lozenge. This is the um, Duluth complex. It's a layered mafic complex of rift age. And the boundary between that and these sedimentary rocks is critical for a lot of different types of mineralization in the region. So the last, uh, I'm going to take a, a brief uh, look at the southern mid-continent in terms of crustal pathways and then wrap up here. So the area we're looking at, uh, we're centered on southeast Missouri. This is the southeast Missouri iron province. We have a lot of iron oxide, copper, gold, and iron oxide apatite deposits in the area, uh, as well as a number of sedimentary hosted deposits. And this area is of great interest because of its potential for critical mineral resources. So we're going to look at this a little bit. Um, so I'm going to slice through a 3D MT model. The iron deposits are shown here by the white triangles, and these white lines are effectively the sutures for the progressive southeastward growth of Laurentia. At the shallow depths here, and right now we're looking at uh, moving in the upper kilometer, we're really reflecting sort of regional uplifts. This is the Ozark Dome, the real foot rift sediments of that, the Illinois Basin. But as we go to greater depths, and right around 10 kilometers, we start picking up these linear structures, which are roughly orthogonal to the, uh, the major tectonic margins. As we go a bit deeper into the lower crust, we can see it sort of looks like a series of cat scratches, effectively, where we interpret this to be uh, former ancient pathways, potentially for fluids, metals, and uh, possibly magma. And the interpretation here is that these are representing uh, transtensional fault zones that formed around the time of granite rhyolite magmatism. So again, these crustal pathways are really important, and you'll note that one falls right on top of uh, where we have these iron deposits, and they continue to lithospheric depths. So uh, to finish off here, um, we've started kind of compiling these, again, with the aim of uh, having these crustal pathways contribute to this mineral systems approach of uh, of doing mineral resource assessment for critical metals, critical minerals. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Uh, all right, well, we will keep rolling. We're past the halfway point. Uh, we're going to Nympha Bennington now. So Nympha, here comes the screen prompt. Okay, just one sec. And is the go to meetings thing showing in the right? Uh, no. Looks good. Okay. All right, just on mine then. Cool. Uh, you'll have to forgive me. My kids are watching a movie downstairs. It's uh, that's the way it is. Um, yeah, so I'm going to shift the discussion to talking about using MT for volcanic systems. And I'm actually a volcano seismologist who integrates MT as a complementary tool for uh, looking at these active volcanic systems. So today I'll be talking about an experiment that's been ongoing for the last several years uh, using magnetotelluric and seismic methods to examine magma storage and transport at Akmak Volcano, which is located in the Aleutians. And this has been a big project uh, between myself, my grad students at UW-Madison, Kerry Key of Lamont Doherty, Matt Haney of the Alaska Volcano Observatory, and Paul Bedrosian, who just spoke um, from USGS Denver. Uh, so this was an amphibious experiment, actually, which is uh, pretty neat. We've done offshore and onshore onshore magnetotellurics, um, so in and around Akmak, uh, as well as onshore seismic. Today, I'll just talk about the onshore work, since that's the modeling that I've been doing. And this included um, installing 13 temporary broadband seismic stations in and around Akmak. Uh, as that was to supplement the 12 permanent Alaska Volcano Observatory stations. Uh, and then in addition, we were able to carry out um, uh, an MT survey in and around the volcano at about 35 different sites that you see there in the bottom left. And so we had a pretty amazing data set and we were able to model 
um, the seismic velocity structure using body waves and ambient noise. Uh, we were able to get at the radial anisotropy structure. And then using this really rich um, magnetotelluric data set, uh, we are starting to model the resistivity structure of the region. So I put up these pictures of us in the field. Um, as I said, I'm a seismologist. So for me, one of the things that's pretty amazing about using magnetotelurics is that unlike seismic, um, MT is actually really happy in an extremely wet environment. So um, you can see in the top left panel, that's myself and Paul Bedrosi, and we're actually able to install one of these MT sites directly in um, an active, uh, excuse me, directly in a vent that was produced uh, during the last eruption at Akmak. And you can see it's incredibly wet and it would not be an appropriate seismic site um, at all. So in terms of using MT and volcanic systems, I think this chart really sums up why it's such a powerful tool. Uh, if you think about igneous rocks, you can see here, uh, they have resistivities on the order of a thousand to even hundreds of thousands of ohm meters. Obviously, as a volcano seismologist, I'm really interested in understanding where's the melt. And so you can see on the opposite side of the chart that rocks containing partial melts, which I've circled here in yellow, have ex extremely low resistivities. They're really great conductors of electricity. And so you see that they have resistivities of on the order of 10 or even as low as uh, hundredths of an ohm meter. And so what happens is when you do these modeling exercises is the presence of melts shows up as really bright anomalies uh, within your model. So these are a few of the um, these are a few of our um, depth slices from the MT model. This is preliminary. These are pre preliminary results. But what you can see is that there's uh, two main uh, low resistivity or really conductive features within our model. One at about 800 meters below model surface, and another at about centered at about uh, two kilometers below model surface. Um, you can see the one at 800 meters is actually a very long, thin kind of interconnected region. And um, for both of these, uh, we're interpreting them in terms of uh, fluids, melts, so magmatic fluids in the system. Uh, the seismic work has actually progressed a little more quickly and was a little easier to model. And so this bottom right-hand panel of this slide, I'm showing kind of a synthesis of all our seismic results into one kind of picture of the volcanic system at Akmak. And so uh, my cursor actually doesn't work, unfortunately, but you see this dashed solid black line in this uh, right-hand corner picture. And that sort of encompasses this region that we're interpreting as uh, sill storage within the caldera, um, containing uh, mafic to maybe more compositionally evolved basaltic andesites um, within those sills. It's really interesting if we compare to the resistivity model itself, uh, we see that we had that large conductor at about two kilometers depth. And that real, I've, uh, excuse me, I've outlined in blue in the resistivity model in the top right, um, this, um, the extent of this sill body. And you can see that that uh, large conductive feature at a, centered at about two kilometers depth really jives in location with the presence of melts at that depth as interpreted from the seismic model. Uh, I should mention that at greater depths, our model is still stuck at the starting model. And this is because we just don't have enough data yet just using onshore data to constrain uh, the deeper structure. We just don't have enough long period data. So the, the next big push to this experiment actually is to start to incorporate uh, this offshore data uh, that my colleague Carrie Key collected um, in this, you see in the bottom left, this kind of ring of offshore MT sites and then this um, perpendicular to trench kind of line of MT. Another thing that I think is really cool and kind of demonstrates the power of MT um, in tandem with seismic is we see this shallow conductor at 800 meters below model surface. If you look in the upper right, it's this really long, thin, extremely conductive feature that we would suggest represents magmatic fluids. Now, in the seismic models, there's no sort of low seismic velocity anomaly 
um, coincident with that. But if you look at the dimensions of this thing, we simply don't have the resolution in our seismic models to image such a feature. But in the world of MT, because we have this long interconnected conductive body, it actually shows up in our models. And so um, it's really cool when you then bring the idea of possibly having shallow melts at around 800 meters below model surface here, and you link it with the petrology. And the petrology is showing for the most recent eruption at Akmak that we were sourcing magmas even as shallowly as something like half a kilometer below the caldera floor. So we're starting to see the appearance of these more segregated regions of magma that we really couldn't get at using seismic alone. So this is just to kind of whet everyone's appetite for the fact that MT and seismic together are incredibly powerful for starting to constrain uh, where we have melts within an active uh, volcanic system. So for us, the future work is really merging that offshore data to get that deeper picture of magma storage and start to see um, what does uh, magma storage look like at greater depths as viewed from the MT side. And then we really want to start to take advantage of the differing model resolutions between seismic and MT and start to carry out some joint inversions um, and sort of modeling the volcanic system in that way. So questions are at the end, so I will just leave things there. Thanks, Nympha. All right, uh, we will uh, shift over to Phil now. So Phil, the screen sharing prompt is on its way. Uh, right, hi everyone, does that show up? Looks good, Phil. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Danny and Iris for bringing us all together for this. Uh, so I'm going to uh, talk about some opportunities and, and some results uh, using uh, MT in subduction environments. And we've had some experience uh, in the Cascades and also in uh, New Zealand. So I just show a few classic pictures here for starters. Uh, the famous one by Wada and Wang in the upper left there. Uh, showing a Cascadia-like uh, subduction zone, uh, variation in temperature down the slip surface, uh, various fluid-related processes being inferred, off-scraping of wet sediments, uh, fluid-induced episodic tremor and slip, um, dehydration, uh, the formation of eclogite in the, in the crust, uh, serpentinization of the mantle wedge, and then fluffing of the mantle wedge closer to the arc to produce uh, water-bearing uh, fluids. So these are inferred from seismic structures or uh, petrology. Uh, some of the glimpses are a little uh, less direct uh, than others. Uh, the uh, lower left shows kind of a water budget figure by uh, Brad Hacker. Uh, the biggest uh, portion there is the expelled pore fluids or off sediments there. Uh, and a goodly uh, fraction going into the wedge and the arc there kind of in the middle. But uh, a great deal is also inferred to be carried to depths beyond the arc. And what happens down there is uh, also an interesting question. So that kind of gets into the back arc regions. And I have the picture here from Roy Heinemann. Uh, water going to greater depths in the asthenosphere. Uh, it's going to influence uh, melting, element transport, uh, rheology of the uh, asthenosphere. Um, and then uh, water also will influence the rheology at higher levels as well, how the crust comes apart, various models. Then the one on the far right, uh, the uh, so-called banana split model, is one where the crust is divided into blocks with uh, kind of discrete deformation. So, go the controls here. Uh, so subduction zone margins can look kind of straight, but uh, also there is segmentation, uh, differences in uh, thrust virgins in the, in the ridge, uh, degree of coupling uh, near the coast, moving from uh, left to right. Uh, uh, segmentation in the episodic tremor and uh, slip uh, recurrence intervals. Uh, uh, segmentation in the magnetism, generally reflecting compression to extension towards the south. And then we've tried to examine some of these things with some uh, MT transects. And I'll talk mainly about uh, these uh, three east-west ones uh, here. And I'll show these to and I'll come back to this one later because we've been extending it some to the east. So what is seismology seen uh, for both the Cafe profile in Washington and the uh, Oregon, the Northwest Oregon profile? We see this coherent uh, low velocity uh, zone uh, considered to be hydrated uh, uh, oceanic crust. 
uh, getting a little ways past the four arc uh, uh, mantle corner there and kind of disappearing. And this has been inferred to be exogite forming reactions and fluid release. And also, especially showing up in Oregon here, is the so called uh, missing moho. Uh, and this uh, is tied to serpentinization and, and uh, lowering of velocity of the velocity of the mantle. Uh, so you don't have a real velocity contrast anymore. Uh, but we're not getting a very direct view of what might be happening with, with the fluids. So in both uh, cases for CAFE and the, uh, the coincident MSLAB uh, profile, uh, Martin showed an inversion section by uh, uh, McGarry and, uh, uh, and uh, Evans and myself before. This is one that I produced uh, independently here. We see uh, what we interpret to be the uh, development and release of fluids in the exogite reactions. Uh, leaving the slab and going into the lower uh, crust and getting uh, to shallower levels uh, towards the arc. Uh, the low frequency earthquakes correspond very uh, tightly to that formation zone, uh, and then the slab carries on and eventually gets some flux melting towards the arc. And sometimes some deeper features as well. We showed up in the 3D earthquake, a 3D earthquake uh, uh, model. Uh, a very similar pattern here for the Oregon line as well, and uh, deep, low, uh, long period earthquakes that the Valley talked about seems to track this. Uh, so here with MT, we're actually getting direct uh, images of uh, where the fluids are developing and where they're going, and, and, and that's a, a more unique uh, feature for us. And then the southern line through the climate here, uh, we extend this to the east, it shows uh, similar kinds of things. Development suddenly of the exosite front here as the slab suddenly uh, dies, according to uh, McCrory, uh, and then a flux melting zone in the back and various uh, underplating uh, uh, zones uh, in the arc and the back arc. Uh, MT can also, if you're in the right place, uh, uncover uh, various uh, structures associated with the slab entering the, the trench. There's this sort of uh, delamination going on here with the high velocity or high resistivity. Oceanic chip, which has been that sort of pegged with the term uh, uh, crustal skinning here, uh, uh, weak serpentinized zone, and the oceanic crust coming off and being absorbed into the upper crust. And we're, we're seeing that feature, we think, uh, fairly well. Uh, so uh, now we've proceeded, uh, uh, this is work I'm uh, doing with my student uh, Kevin Mendoza here, uh, coincident. Uh, wide band and long period uh, soundings here in a long transect uh, towards. Uh, 2,000 kilometers in length, and we have merged uh, work that the USGS and New Colorado has done with Danny Floyd and, and Paul Bedrosian. Uh, this is a 2D section for the moment, but you see uh, quite a few interesting features here. Uh, surface of the slab uh, from McCrory and then from uh, seismic tomography here, uh, a big cherry rich zone in the uh, oceanic uh, plate itself, otherwise uh, crystalline and resistive. And then this kind of uh, evolving. Uh, Low resistivity uh, headed to the east, most strong near the plate, and then uh, headed off to uh, less values. And then a lot of complex uh, moho level structures here across the Great Basin, not appearing in the unextended Colorado Plateau. Uh, so some ties uh, the melt accumulation zone that Holly uh, resolved from the Mendocino experiment seems to show good correspondence there. Uh, in the uh, more high conductivity zone here, where uh, we expect a greater degree of water fluxing close to the slab. Uh, the basalts coming up uh, seem to be relatively wet. They're relatively dry as you get into western Utah here. Uh, the temperatures seem to be uh, higher uh, seismically. Uh, the uh, average mantle 80 of that there may be uh, enhanced by a couple hundred uh, degrees. And so that high temperature feature we're suggesting might reflect a, 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 in a drying out zone here in the uppermost uh, mantle. Now to interpret to interpret features like this, you know, obviously there's non-uniqueness as has been suggested before. Uh, fluids are one possibility or melts, uh, but also hydration of the solid uh, state minerals, olivines, pyroxenes, is something that shows up in resistivity and does not show up in seismic velocity. So that's kind of a unique opportunity for us. And you can get at how much that might be based on lab experiments. Here I show some by uh, Novella and others here that when the PPM of water in, in this case, uh, the dominant olivine uh, goes up, the resistivity goes down or the conductivity goes up. Uh, and the question you have to ask is how much can you put in here before you run into the uh, water under saturated melting point? And uh, Mark Kirschman's group has done a lot of work on what that hydration is. Uh, so according to these lab measurements, uh, this diagram is sitting at about the point where uh, this resistivity uh, corresponds to a saturated 
concentrated mineralogy. In here, kind of too much, uh, probably some melts are involved, and then it's sort of fading off to the east. There is some disagreement in the lab measurements, and this will kind of shift where this occurs, west or east, but we think that will, will settle down. And then at the upper levels, this shows kind of the beauty of MT. It's very broad bandwidth. You can look essentially from mantle source to crustal sink in these uh, fluid melt processes here. So this is kind of a blow up here in western Nevada. Uh, we see these various crustal zones, which have been pegged to magmatic underplating. The old Pascal experiment showed a P-wave attenuation, high reflectivity, and a high velocity pillow. And then you see these various structures that actually go up and join into high temperature geothermal systems here. This is Dixie Valley, McGinnis Hills, uh, that have elevated uh, helium-3 coming out of them. And so we have this hundreds down to single kilometer scale uh, images that you can get from MT. And these are tied well with various uh, hot springs geochemical interpretations that Laura Crossy and Carl Kostrom were talking about based on uh, uh, travertine and other deposits in the Grand Canyon system, uh, which uh, joins uh, the west of Utah uh, area here. So the takeaways I have are that uh, high MT bandwidth allows source to sink views. You have to do a lot of work to collect all of that data, but you really get marvelous scale views uh, that you don't really get from other methods. You get unique info on the water cycle. You know, estimates are that one to a few current ocean volumes have gone down the subduction zones of the Earth past the arc, and where have those gone, and what carries them down. You want a uh, rigorous interpretation in terms of the petrology. I just uh, advocate everybody get to know your phase diagrams, water, silicate, salts. Very important to paint the picture of what's happening in your geophysical images. Temperature is probably the most important constraint. Uh, we tend to adopt uh, various adiabats here and let the resistivity tell us about something else. And then the block terrain model of crustal rheology seems to pertain to the Great Basin as it's coming apart in modern day drifting. Okay, thanks, Phil. Um, and then uh, to close it out, we're going to shift over to Ben Murphy. So, Ben, here comes the prompt. All right. How is that looking? Looks good. Looking good. Cool. So, thank you, Andy. Um, oh, boy. Sorry about that. Let me go back over here. Um, yeah, so um, as my title suggests, I want to tell you a little bit about some MT work we've done in the southeastern US and uh, try to convince you that MT imaging is, is really useful for getting at uh, lithospheric properties and lithospheric dynamic studies. And I'm going to have to go through all of this very quickly. If you're interested in learning more, we have a paper on this that came out last year in GQ. cubed And so in the southeastern US, as we started working with MT data from this region, we discovered this very surprising high resistivity structure here. And the reason why it's so surprising is because of what these high resistivity values mean in terms of temperature. So if you look on the right, you can see um, a figure that shows you how um, mantle, different mantle minerals conduct electricity as a function of temperature, how the resistivity is vary. And the important thing to notice here is that there's a limit on how resistive the mantle can be as a function of temperature. And for the high resistivity values, that we observe in this big structure, this big resistive structure, um, we're, we're basically limited to temperatures no, of no more than 1200 degrees C. And that, that means then, um, in terms of the thermal lithosphere, you know, we think of the thermal lithosphere asthenosphere boundary, we take that to be about the 1300 degrees C isotherm. What that means then, for in this specific image that I'm showing you here, is that the thermal LAB has to be way down at like 350 kilometers, which is insane. That's like cratonic. Um, we can we can do some resolution tests on our data, and we know that we we only really require this resistive structure to go down to 200 kilometers depth. That's still saying then that the thermal LAB has to be at least at 200 kilometers depth underneath this region. And if we compare that to seismic imaging, we, we would con the seismic results show kind of a different story. These are just a few different results on the left here as an example of a surface wave tomography model. There have been many of these published, but they all kind of show the same thing. At 120 kilometers, 150 kilometers, you kind of see slightly slow velocities with respect to reference models. And body wave imaging shows uh, a similar kind of story. This, this is just one example, a depth slice of 200 kilometers, you see slightly slow velocities with respect to reference models. And so this has given rise to an interpretation that the thermal lithosphere in this region 
is actually is relatively thin, that it's warm, and that it's been eroded over time from edge convection along the passive margin. And so we're left with these two seemingly contradictory views of lithospheric properties in this region. From the MT, you would infer a big, thick, cold, coherent block of thermal lithosphere. But from seismic imaging, you would conclude that the, the thermal lithosphere is relatively thin, no more than 150 kilometers thick, and that it's been kind of piecemeal eroded and delaminated over time. And of course, these both can't be true. And so what we've actually been able to do is, is integrate these two uh, seemingly disparate uh, sets of geophysical results and show that the seismic results are actually perfectly consistent with the MT picture. And the way that we've done that is by uh, considering inelastic controls on seismic observables. I'm just going to show you a few quick examples here. But uh, this is for uh, surface wave VS. If you look at different depths, you pull out the um, actual observed velocity values and you evaluate for different models of analasticity the expected shear velocity at the cold temperatures required by MT, here 1,000, here about 1,100, 1,200 degrees C. The predictions are actually perfectly consistent with observations. The story is similar with body wave imaging. Um, this is just showing you here for two different hypothetical geotherms that both satisfy the MT data. Um, the analastic predictions for both VP and BS are in fact slightly slow with respect to AK-135. So this, this kind of leads us to an interesting point where we've got these very high resistivity values, slow seismic velocities, slow observed seismic velocities, but this is leading us to a picture of kind of thick, coherent thermolithosphere in this region, which is, is probably pretty surprising to a lot of you that, that that's where we end up. And I, I just want to briefly comment on why what, what might be the cause of this. And I think that this is related to the last major margin-wide geologic event in this region, the eruption of the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province at 200 MA, right after rifting of Pangaea. And the map in the middle here shows the distribution of camp dikes in the southeastern US. And at, so, so the lithosphere in this region is kind of maybe this weird intermediate age lithosphere. It's, it's an order of magnitude younger than the cratonic regions that we often like to study. It's also an order of magnitude older than the active tectonic regions that we, we like to study. And you know, we're so used to looking at these kind of end members that this might just be this kind of weird class that we're really not used to looking at as geophysicists. I also briefly want to just throw out the possibility that this structure could represent a Mesozoic example of craton formation. I've already talked about how it's 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 thick, it's cold. The MT data also very really strongly suggests that it's basically entirely dry, that there's very little dissolved water in the non anhydrous minerals that make up the mantle here. And so it's probably rheologically very strong and it's going to be resistant to recycling on long geologic time scales. So I'm going to wrap up here just to say that MT can really provide invaluable insights into lithospheric properties and dynamics. In, in this specific example, a lot of the insights that I've talked about are really driven by the MT observations. And more generally, I think that integrating MT and seismic results of several of my colleagues on this uh, panel have discussed is, is really a, a powerful way of really constraining um, Earth properties. And I think a lot of us are hoping that the MT facility at IRIS is going to facilitate much more um, joint uh, MT and seismic experiments. So I'll end here. If you're interested in learning more about this, I know I kind of just went over this very briefly, but um, you can look up our paper. The reference is here, published in GQ last year. And I will leave you with this nice cat picture in the lower right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ben. Um, all right, well, I'm gonna take, uh, take back screen sharing abilities. Let's see if I can find that. Um, and I just want to say uh, right at the top, thank you so much to our seven speakers. Uh, you all, uh, I think, showed an enormous amount of interesting results in a very compressed format. I know five to seven minutes uh, is, is not easy to say something meaningful in the sciences when you're dealing with very high level info. So uh, congratulations on that. Everybody did a great job. Um, so there are some questions that are uh, already in the till. What I'm gonna do is just show a couple slides very quickly, uh, just as kind of a continuation of the introduction to this program that, um, that I had made uh, before, after the last webinar. So um, as was introduced in the mailing for this webinar, uh, the IRIS MT facility or the SAGE MT facility is gonna be operated from the Pascal Instrument Center in Socorro, New Mexico. Um, Pascal has been around uh, at, at, in Socorro since the late 90s, and it's 
supported well over uh, a thousand individual experiments for investigators uh, all over working all over the world. So this is just a quick picture of the the staff that works at the PIC. Uh, here's a view inside the warehouse, which is right there. And um, we're procuring new MT systems where we've uh, just placed an order for a dozen LEMI 424 long period systems. Uh, those should be uh, in our possession uh, before the end of the year, hopefully sooner. There's uh, obviously some supply chain slowdowns related to the current uh, uh, biologic and geopolitical situation. And uh, those should be available for PIs uh, for use in 2021. Uh, in addition, uh, or just to describe these instruments a little bit, they have very similar characteristics to the NIMS, which are kind of the uh, recognized NSF-owned long period MT system that was available previously. Although they're, they should be considerably easier to operate, uh, we have one of these already. We've been putting it through the paces and that, that's what led us to that decision to order more of them. We're procuring electrodes over the next couple months. We're evaluating uh, a set of electrodes right now, uh, or several different sets, to see which is going to be best performance-wise for uh, the facility. And we'll be looking at wideband and broadband systems this summer. Um, so if you're a potential facility user, what you should expect is that there will be instruments available by next year. You should uh, consider writing proposals that request uh, to use these uh, based on that timeline and that as a, a user of the PIC, there'll be training, uh, 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 advice on logistics and data handling support for PIs, and all of this is at no cost. This is provided uh, through the IRIS facility, through the SAGE program uh, from NSF. The data will be archived or will be required to be archived at the IRIS Data Management Center uh, in a format called PH5. If you're a seismologist, you've probably heard of that format. It's an HDF5 compatible format, and right now uh, IRIS and uh, members of the MT community are working on finalizing details about how MT data will fit into that format and what the standards for, uh, for that format's metadata and, and data structure will be, will be set so that it can be exchangeable and, and recognizable. Um, we're also working on exploring what software options we'll have available for people that need to do data processing off of MT. That's uh, obviously no small task, and so we want to have that available and supportable. And uh, most instruments from the PIC, there, there's a priority that's for U.S. researchers. Uh, so if you're uh, an international researcher here, uh, one way to be involved in the use of these instruments is to form collaborations with U.S. investigators, uh, maybe have some sort of research partnership where uh, some of the work is done in your country. Uh, that's often how uh, uh, IRIS uh, administered instrumentation goes abroad. Um, we're advised by the community. So uh, any decisions that we make are uh, typically uh, advised or weighed in on by uh, a governance structure. So uh, the names that you see here are people that are actively involved in the Electromagnetic Advisory Committee right now. You can recognize several of them gave talks today. So um, if you want to talk to somebody that knows MT, uh, I'm a seismologist by trade. I manage the program, but there are MT investigators that work with us on a daily basis. And so those are these are names of some people that you could interact with if you have uh, questions or concerns or or just want to know more about the, the program. Um, so what can you do next if this is something you're interested in? Well, we have a mailing list. Uh, you can get information more directly that way. Uh, so updates on the program will go out there as they're uh, relevant. Um, if you're a potential uh, principal investigator within the US uh, from NSF or other agencies, uh, submit proposals or supplement requests to work that you already have that's funded if you think that MT can be a valuable uh, tool in your research. We'll have future webinars. Uh, topics will include field practices, data processing strategies, uh, specific research applications or case studies, kind of expanded versions of some of the, maybe the talks that you've seen today. But uh, we are open to suggestions on what we should schedule next. Uh, so if there's something that you really want to hear more about, either on the sort of practical side or on the research side, send me a note, uh, and I'm happy to take that under consideration and work to have something scheduled. Uh, we have a special interest group meeting, and there'll be other MT uh, research presented, most likely at the Sage Gage workshop, which is the sort of joint facilities funded by NSF workshop that's uh, as of now, still scheduled for mid-August in Colorado. Uh, if it's canceled due to uh, due to COVID, 
then we'll likely try to set up some sort of virtual uh, set of activities just to keep people um, sort of in the loop about what these facilities are doing and what's the cutting edge research in these research communities. And finally, we're sort of in the long-term process of planning a field uh, methods and data processing short course that would uh, occur most likely in Socorro, New Mexico at near, near or at the Pascal Instrument Center in summer 2021. And we've set aside funding for at least 12 attendees. So if you're somebody that uh, has little to no experience in MT and wants to get your hands dirty with both the, the instruments and the data processing uh, options, then that's something you should really uh, really keep on your radar. So uh, any you know questions or uh, concerns, feel free to contact me. Uh, I love to get emails about this program. And with that, uh, we will go and take a look at what uh, what questions are in the in the uh, uh, that's been submitted for this. So um, okay. So there are plenty of questions that have been submitted. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start right at the top, um, and I think everything's basically uh, in order. So this is uh, for Chloe. Uh, there's a, a handful of questions related to your study, um, and uh, question from uh, Tunde Bello is asking uh, how long uh, was each survey that was done, and uh, how did you keep your battery from depleting quickly? Yeah, that's a great question. So because we were only interested in imaging sort of the upper 10 kilometers, uh, we left each station out for about 24 hours. Um, other Antarctic surveys done by like Phil Wanamaker and Jared Peacock and Kate Selway and Graham Hill. Uh, I know they've left stations out for a lot longer because they're interested in imaging much deeper like crustal and even upper mantle structure. Um, so because we were able to move our stations basically every day, uh, our survey that I showed at Lake Willens was about two and a half weeks long. Uh, and then what was the second part of that question, Andy? Uh, so the question, uh, the other part of it was uh, just dealing with battery life and uh, depleting your power source. Oh, right. Um, so we didn't have too much of an issue with our batteries. We did some testing uh, in McMurdo, which is the U.S. base station, where we just hooked up one of our stations outside and we didn't actually see as big of an effect like the cold didn't affect our batteries as much as we would expect. Uh, we did have one station that we left out for a very long time and we just uh, hooked up multiple batteries to that station. Uh, I know other people have also used solar panels in addition to a battery as well. Uh, and that's worked well because when you're doing these Antarctic surveys, it's in the Antarctic summer. Uh, so the sun is out all the time. So solar panels are a great way to also keep power going to your instruments. Okay, um, next question is from Paulo Edmundo Frieri. And uh, Paulo asks, how do you know if your MT data set is or isn't affected by a static shift? Yeah, um, so I, we did have one station at least that we thought had some static shift effects. You can usually, for us at least, if um, one station looked very different in our higher frequencies, which were more sensitive to the ice and snow, uh, we would we suspected there could be static shift. Um, and for the most part, you can assume that your snow and ice are going to be pretty resistive. Uh, but I guess, yeah, the check that we used for problems with static shift was just if a station looked very different from all the other stations or uh, if there was a big split in the TE and TM mode that we wouldn't expect. Okay, uh, next question is from Rob Gordon. And Rob was uh, curious uh, if you could give a good estimate on the depth of the lake and whether it was likely to be salt water. Yeah, that's something I didn't have 
time to cover in my talk, but they have actually drilled into this lake and they found that it was two-ish meters uh, in depth, so it's not a super deep lake. And when they sampled the lake, they did find a small percentage uh, seawater component, so it was slightly salty. And then also when they examined pore waters from the upper 35 centimeters beneath the lake, they saw that the pore waters increased in salinity with depth as well. Uh, so that data set was uh, part of our dry or sort of drove our hypothesis uh, that there might be some deeper salty groundwater beneath the lake. Okay, a uh, couple more questions related to the, uh, Chloe, to your study. Uh, one's from John Vidali. John asked, do seismic measurements reinforce the MT interpretation? Uh, so the seismic data collected here was active seismic and it didn't go very deep. The only uh, published seismic data right now only goes about 150 meters. Uh, below the base of the ice. Uh, their seismic survey was really aimed at seeing if they could image the water column from the actual lake. Uh, so it's going to be a little bit tricky to compare our empty results with that seismic data just because the scales are uh, a bit different. Um, but I have talked to Sridhar Ananda Krishnan at Penn State is one of the PIs that collected that data set. And uh, he told me he does have some data that might go a little bit deeper. So we will eventually try to incorporate some seismic imaging if possible. OK, um, so we have kind of a, a two part question from Tim Bartholomew. Uh, so first part is, um, how did you go from conductivity to salinity, acknowledging a number of non-unique elements uh, in that inversion? Yeah, that's a great question and something we're still working on. Uh, so right now, my, my interpretation of salty groundwater is sort of based on using uh, Archie's law, which is commonly used in MT, but it does assume that uh, the conductivity variations are mostly driven by changes in poor water salinity. Uh, so I've used Archie's law and I've looked at a few different sediment compaction models to assume porosity changes with depth. Uh, and then something else to consider in this region is that there is a higher than normal geothermal heat flux. Uh, so I've used those heat flux models as well to try to constrain temperature. Um, but we're, this is still a work in progress and uh, that's definitely a really good point to bring up is that conductivity can mean a lot of different things. And right now we're trying to be careful and make sure we've uh, covered all our bases on that front. All right, uh, and the other half of Tim's question was, um, Tim notes that it looked like you blanked out the ice resistivities. Uh, was there something you saw in the end glacial resistivity that uh, led you to blank out those depths? Uh, so my ice resistivity, I've constrained, I left it as a free parameter in my inversion and it showed up as white in those images because uh, my color scale has white as the most resistive feature. Um, so I did leave ice as a free parameter but constrained it uh, given some different studies of ice resistivity and it's interesting to me, um, even though I allow the ice to be free within some constraints, it does tend to choose the uh, lower resistivity values. And even if I leave the ice totally free, uh, it still stays pretty resistive. Um, but part of the reason I do constrain it is so that uh, the inversion will allow a really sharp jump from the very resistive ice to the much more conductive sediments beneath it because uh, the inversion inherently wants to be smooth unless you tell it otherwise. 
Okay, uh, and I think last question related to your work is from uh, George Jurassic. And George was curious uh, why uh, MT was used versus something like radar uh, for measuring fluids below the ice, if there's any advantage or disadvantage. So there has been radar data collected in this area, and I didn't show those lines basically because it's very extensive and covers most of the lake. And they, similar to the seismic case, the radar data was mostly used to look at uh, the, the surface water or the water at the very base of the ice sheet. And it doesn't really go uh, a whole lot deeper. So we used MT because it's uh, very good at sensing deeper structures and has, um, Although the resolution isn't as good as radar, uh, we, can, we have a greater depth sensitivity with MT. So that's why we used MT in this case. All right, uh, thanks so much, Chloe. Uh, so the next set of questions, a uh, couple uh, for Jared. And uh, the first one's from Anusha Adara. And the um, uh, question is, uh, I guess in general, how uh, how do you note how electrical data respond to differences in geothermal fluids? Uh, I guess his area has uh, quite a bit of geothermal resources, and is it impossible to interpret the data without going into detailed modeling? Um, yeah, so the last part of the question, I would have to say that you definitely need to model your data to understand what it's representing. Uh, as far as interpretation, I mean, that's that's where we get into, where you can get into trouble as to what you're interpreting, and you really need to understand your system along with other geophysical information, whether that be geochemistry, uh, drill data, um, anything you can get your hands on, really, because thermal alteration and fluids can look the same. So you want to make sure that you're interpreting correctly so you don't drill a bad hole. It's gotten us into trouble in the past. Okay, uh, next question is from Zakaria uh, Bukalfa, and uh, Zakaria is uh, asking uh, if airborne TMI maps can be correlated with MT models? Uh, yeah, definitely. So TMI images are really good at locating structures, like where faults are mainly, and that can help constrain your resistivity model as to what you're seeing and where boundaries are. Uh, and it's really helpful for looking at these blind geothermal systems. All right, thanks, Jared. Uh, so there's a question pivoting over to Jeff and the geothermal pairing. Um, and that's from uh, and, M, Andre uh, Pambonen. And Andre asks, how uh, deep a groundwater system are you able to resolve uh, in an MT study? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. We just kind of did this, uh, our synthetic study using kind of a typical regional flow system. I think we did a six kilometers depth, but it, as you can see in some of uh, Phil's work, you can see fluids uh, to really great depth. I mean, that, yeah, that magmatic underplating. So it really just kind of depends on on the type of, on the scale of the system that you're, that you want to uh, be considering in your model. As far as the smaller scale, uh, you'd probably end up using something, I don't know, if you're looking really shallow, like contaminant transport, you'd be using something like DC resistivity probably. So uh, our particular application of MT is mainly looking at these regional flow systems. Thanks, Jeff. Um, all right, uh, next couple questions are for Ninfa. Um, so pivoting over uh, to the next talk, and um, we have one from Lindsay Hagee asks uh, if topography was included in your MT inversion. Uh, no, not at this time. 
Uh, the bathymetry is something that we're playing with quite a bit because that seems to bear out quite a bit of importance. Um, the caldera rim, I think, is something like maybe a half kilometer over sea level. So my feeling, and I, I certainly could be wrong, is that the really nailing the bathymetry is more important than the topography as specific to Akmak. Okay, uh, thank you. And then uh, the last question for you is uh, from John Vidali, and John asks, uh, what are the prospects of seeing temporal changes in volcanoes for hazard assessment with MT? Um, if so, you know, would it be reasonable to operate a permanent station on, say, Mount Rainier or Mount Hood? Yeah, that's, um, you know, the, these temporal methods for seismic are much further along than MT. Currently, maybe there's been one study done, and I know there's a paper either coming out any day now or has come out um, by Graham Hill uh, using sort of a temporal MT approach, uh, but it's pretty pretty in its infancy, so um, you know it's it's not necessarily ready for like an observatory level. Okay, um, thanks, Ninfa. So last two questions are for Phil, and I think these are the last questions that we're gonna get unless uh, anybody has any final uh, final ones they'd like to submit. Um, so uh, Luciana Astiz uh, asks if uh, if you have any of any transects at other latitudes uh, within the the Great Basin. Uh, hi. Uh, yeah, we did publish an earlier one in 08, which is down at uh, latitude 38.5. It's not nearly uh, as long as the one I emphasized today. I guess when putting uh, the long one together, I think I identified almost the only corridor where I thought you could actually get through all the way and think you could get something useful from predominantly a 2D interpretation. Uh, but I think it's certainly doable uh, elsewhere. There, there's other corridors, you know, certainly of hundreds of kilometers length that you could you, you could valuably get good good views from. Okay, uh, and then uh, the last questions are from uh, Seya Bolaranwa, um, and uh, one is how. Um, how can MT be applied to oil and gas, uh, the oil and gas exploration industry, and if there's any inherent limitations in that? Uh, that one's for me. Um, yes, yep, sorry. It, certainly, uh, salt dome structures uh, show up as resistive bodies. Uh, we actually see that some on our long transect uh, going through the Utah transition zone. Um, uh, Overthrust structures, if you have competent uh, carbonate rocks or crystalline rocks that have been shoved over younger sediments, uh, those are fairly classic examples. A lot of work was done in the New Guinea system that way. So, uh, yes, yeah, it certainly has some application. All right. Uh, thanks a lot, Phil. Um, so I think I think with that, we're we're done. Uh, I really want to thank again all the speakers. Uh, you guys did a wonderful job. Uh, in, a, in a compressed format. And uh, I want to thank the audience. So I think at peak, we were close to 200 people uh, and we still have about 100 hanging around. So uh, thanks everybody that, that stuck around for questions. Um, so I will, uh, I will end the recording and this will end up on YouTube very shortly. And uh, please stay tuned for uh, future webinars on uh, MT activities that uh, the SAGE facility is uh, supporting. So thanks again and take care, everybody.